Uh, thank you very much, Rajiv and Eclif, for inviting me here. Um, it's really hard to follow an act by Francois Pinier. <laughs> you know, one of the things people don't know about me is uh, I'm not a sportswoman, as you know. <laughs> but the only game I would stay up in the middle of the night to watch is rugby. Um, <laughs> the other thing is that uh, there are very few people who inspire me. Uh, but the one person who has made me go on the streets to march is Nelson Mandela. At the time, I was in the UK, and uh, they had a free Nelson Mandela watch, and we had to march on the streets of Glasgow, and so I did. So to be now in the presence of people like Francois and all the distinguished uh, speakers is such a daunting task for me now to, to speak to you. But um, and the other thing that happened recently in New York is I actually had an audience with Matt Damon. So this is like almost like, uh, you know, a bit of an overdose right now. So like, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it was, he was in the hall, he was speaking at the Clinton Global Initiative, and he's just such a decent human being uh, doing work with water.org. So in the shadows of these uh, great people, Mandela, Francois, and other people who've done such great work in this world, I'm here really to share my story and why I'm what I am and what I'm doing. Now, I was born with the gift of diversity. Um, it's in my genes to want diversity in my entire life. I come from mixed parentage. My father was a typical Johor civil servant. And my mother was a Chinese woman who had a very interesting background. Now, my mother, my grandfather, came from Fujian, uh, met my grandmother, a Nyonya Chinese in Penang, married her, had five children, and like every good Chinese sailor, abandoned his wife and children <laughs> and went back to China. So my grandmother, had to come down from Penang with her children. And she had four girls, and the youngest was a boy. My mother was the youngest girl. And put three of the elder girls into convent uh, in Suramban, Convent Holy Infant Jesus. And my mother and her little brother were then living in the back room of a rich relative, helping with errands and trying to go to school, washing bottles in the FNN factory after school. My mother fell in love with um, a British soldier and married him. And, uh, and then the British wouldn't recognize the marriage at the time because she was Chinese, and all Chinese are communists, if you didn't know that. Um, so, so she had her little daughter and my sister, who then had to come back all the way to Sremban and. She had to give up her daughter to the husband because he was worried that she couldn't take care of her on the promise that she would go to England to study. But of course, she was kept in Singapore and without my mother knowing till her daughter was 18. My father, on the other hand, was, as I said, a typical Malay civil servant who would get up in the morning, take his walks, have a, had a lovely wife uh, in Moa, Moa, for those who know, uh, and uh, had a daughter, and then adopted three abandoned Chinese girls. So I think there must be some affinity to Chinese people here in my family. Uh, so he had four daughters then, and his wife died. And he met my mom, they fell in love, and they married. So I have a mother who is born Buddhist, became a Christian, and became a Muslim. I have a father who only knew Islam, very conservative kind of, you know, normal life kind of human being, but who embraced my mother's life and made sure we all respected it. So we were brought up loving diversity, celebrating the roots of my mother and her journey, a very painful journey actually, and, and therefore um, in our family there's a lot of intermarriage and uh, we're like a little mini United Nations, so you can imagine a lot of conflict. So, <laughs> and I think because I'm the youngest in the family of, you know, extended family, we are 13. Uh, being the youngest, you're able to observe these things and try and figure out, you know, you can't have a louder voice because you're drowned at 13. So one of the things my mother used to say to me, 
If you can't shout out, you need to know how to negotiate. So my father was really wonderful, a really, really wonderful man. One of the things he loved most and inculcated in me was reading. So we would read together and do everything together. And I was born when he had retired. Now, in those days, retirement age was 50 or 51. Uh, so my mother was also older. I always tell my mother, oh my goodness, you don't know how risky it was for you to have a pregnancy you know, at that age. You know, you, I could, it could have gone wrong. Um, so, so anyway, to cut the long story short, so he would wait for me in school. And we would go, I was in Asunta school. Tan Sri Zeti and I share the same alma mater. Uh, like all good convent girls, we, we are taught to be decent human beings first and then be very smart scholars later on. But some of, them, some of us managed to try and achieve a little bit of both. Um, so anyway, just talking about my father, because it's really important because that's a bit of my history, is that in standard one, he would wait outside my class. And every time I turned around, if he wasn't there, I would scream. So the bottom line is I'm extremely spoiled. I had everything done for me when I was young because I was much loved. My father died when I was 11. I watched my father die very slowly from cancer. My mother, who was spending most of her time in the kitchen then, had to go to work. So my father said, do what you think you want to do. And she said, I want to go into shipping. So there is some insanity gene in my family. <laughs> so uh, from a housewife, she decided she wanted to do shipping. And my father said, fine. And my early memories, even when he was ill, was us driving. He had an MGBGT and uh, driving to Port Klang. And he would sit on the edge of the wharf with a tiffin carrier waiting for my mother. And he and I, my mom, would eat. And she would work, you know, directing laborers and all this kind of stuff. And um, when he died, she was very young. She was 40-something. She was very beautiful. Um, when she died, she had 450 staff and uh, in a fairly successful corporation. So I think growing up in that environment where home was also like a little refugee camp. In the evenings, we lived in Jalan Gasing in, in, in PJ. And at home, in the evenings, the furniture would be pushed aside and mattresses would be rolled out. And people would come and sleep in our house. I have no idea who they are. <laughs> Some of them are actually relatives of very successful people who were having a hard time. But my father and mother would buy rice by the sacks and feed everyone. And it was always someone looking for a job, someone who had lost a job, you know, a relative who's come here who needs help or non-relative. When May 13, 1969 happened, my father, who did marketing, <coughs> would know everybody in the market, from the fishmonger, the vegetable seller, the chicken seller. So when May 13 happened, the marketers would come during the, 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 the non-curfew hours and send food stuff to our house. So we would then be a little bit of a distribution channel. Because I was little then, I was very young, and my brother and I, because we were short and small, we could go into the monsoon drains that became a supply chain. So we would actually go around the neighborhood and send eggs, rice, flour, sugar, whatever. I grew up in that environment. And um, so when my brother, bless him, he turns around to me and he says, are you out of your mind? You're you know, one of the most successful obstetricians and gynecologists, and you're doing this. And I looked at him and I said, are you out of your mind? Look at how we grew up. So when I started my career in medicine, I chose obstetrics and gynecology because I'm actually much more comfortable with women. And I hope next year there'll be 50% women on stage. Um, and I will help you find the 50% because they're much better women than me. But I loved my job. 
I, you know, I've delivered about 14,000 babies in my life. I bet some of you in here have some relationship with me, somehow or other. <laughs> I've never been to a place where nobody has come up to me to say, oh, you delivered my daughter or my sister's child or whatever. Anyway, and then it was teaching first. I love teaching. So I used to teach in University of Kabasa, Malaysia, and so forth. And then I went into private practice. And it was fantastic. Your own clinic, your own setup, your own thing. My husband's also a gynecologist and obstetrician. But one of the best things I did was I married well. My husband's not here today because he has to work, um, but he always tells people, you know, they come to him and they say, you know, your wife is so successful, you know, so what's the secret? So he says, you know, the saying behind every successful man, there's a very <laughs> strong woman, yeah. Behind every successful woman, there's a suffering man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so... <laughs> So he, he, he has a great sense of humor, but most of all, I've never met anyone who loved me and is so proud of me uh, than my husband. So I owe much of whatever my success is to him as well. So rewind, 1998. In Malaysia, the career path of a doctor is a very restricted one. So I don't understand why everybody wants their children to be doctors. I seriously don't understand, and we can have a conversation about that. You go to medical school, you graduate, you work, you have to do three years government compulsory service. Sometimes you continue in government, you become lecturer, you become professor, you become a top consultant, you become private practitioner, or you become GP. You don't have space to take a year off and do something that you like. Because if you do that, then you fall back in terms of your promotion and things. It, it's very different from the West, where you can take a gap year, you can do all sorts of things, and you know, try and exploit things that you like. So I was always constantly frustrated. I did medicine because I really liked working with people, and I really wanted to help people. So in 1998, I didn't remember the Bosnia crisis and all that, and I was like, I want to help. You know, I can't go. University wouldn't let me go, and all that kind of stuff. So when I was in private practice, I decided, ah, I can go now because, you know what, if I don't come to work, the only thing that happens is I have no money. But I don't have a boss. I don't have to say, you know, can I take leave and things like that. I mean, actually, I should have. I broke all the rules. But, you know, it was more of an independent time. And then I was watching television, and it was Kosovo at the time. I was with my five-year-old kid, my son, who regrets it till this day, what he said to me. And I looked at it, and I said, television, I said, look at these children. Look at them. They're so hungry, and there's you know th things that mothers do, right, to make their children feel guilty. Um, you know, look at them. You know, you have to. You know, you can't waste food, and you have to study hard. No, no, no. And you know, look at these people. And he turned around to me. He looked, and he says, "Don't just say it, mommy. You're a doctor. Go and do something." So, so I said, "Oh, hang on a minute. Wisdom from a five-year-old, kind of scary." So I went to my husband and I said, he's right, you know, I want to do these things, I want to do these things. He said, yeah, okay, okay, go and do these things. So I wrote to everyone. I wrote to every organization in Malaysia I knew that I thought would take me to a humanitarian field. Not one single person replied. Not one single organization replied. Everybody must have thought this mad woman, probably very unhappy in marriage, wants to go away, you know? <laughs> so, so, so anyway, nobody replied. So I said, okay, nobody replied. So I wrote to Medicines Home Frontier, the Nobel-winning organization, Doctors Without Borders, so sexy. And uh, I applied, and I said, they said, come, we'll do an interview with you on, tele on, on telephone, and we'll see what we can do. I said, I'm willing to go. Okay. Then my husband looked at me, and he said, you know, why do you want to do this? I said, I want to do this because Malaysia cannot measure development by these tall buildings and the highways. We cannot call ourselves stewards on the earth if we don't care about people. Global solidarity is everyone's responsibility. I'm a human first, and then I'm a Malaysian. We all have to feel compassion. Otherwise, why do we study so hard to be soulless? Why did I become a doctor to only make money? So he said, OK, I hear you. But if you join Medicines on Frontier, you're just one Malaysian in an international organization. Why don't you set up an organization and build a platform for Malaysians to do good? Be a symbol that you can, 
as a woman, as a Muslim, as a Malaysian, to make your mark in the international arena. The moral of the story, ladies and gentlemen, is I'm just a very obedient Muslim wife. <laughs> and my husband says, set up an organization. I set up an organization. You know, so, so, uh, so I did. Now, in Malaysia, for those who are always complaining about uh, registrar of societies, let me tell you the insight. To be a Malaysian organization, you need to have seven signatories from seven board members, founding board members from seven states. I'm born in Negris Milan, by accident. Uh, seriously, by accident, it's a long story. Uh, then my husband is born in Pahang, so two. So I knocked my neighbor's house. Hey, where, did, where were you born? <laughs> Malacca. The other one, Kelantan. Went to the office the next day. I did surgery. My anesthetist, Dr. Ui. Ui, where are you born? Kedah. Oh, six, five. I <laughs> uh, know. The surgeon next door. Where are you born? Sabah, six. One more, one more, one more. And then I said to my niece, why don't you join me and help me? She said, okay. Selango. So we had seven names. The only constitution I had, at that time, not very clever, okay? I mean, now also not so clever. But, you know, I didn't have lawyer friends, that's the problem. So, 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 you know, I just looked at the constitution that was on my table, which was the Malaysian Menopause Society. <laughs> I am the founding vice president of the Malaysian Menopause Society. At the time where women who had menopause didn't know what was going on with them, they were going bonkers, it's serious, huh? And the men were coming and said, my wife wanted to kill me last week, you know, uh, uh, but we formed the Malaysian Menopause Society, my prof and I. So I, tra I translated every word that had menopause into humanitarian. Can you imagine what, this, what, what, the, what, the, uh, what the constitution looked like? Absolutely crazy, right? And submitted it to the Registrar of Societies. And, but as I submitted it, I picked up the phone and I spoke to the, the man on the other line. I said, what's your name? This is Mr. Jaya. Mr. Jaya? You don't know me, I don't know you. Are you Hindu? He says, yes, I'm Hindu. Practicing? He says, yeah, yeah. Vegetarian all? Yeah, yeah. He says, uh. Right, in Hinduism, it's bad, right, to kill and do things that are bad to people. He says, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to set this up, Mr. Jaya. You must help me. And I said, I don't know how to write this constitution. I've tried. Can you help me? He said, okay, okay. I had this man who I never met in my life, only on the phone, Handwritten in red ink, every correction on the ROS form. The, the normal time to register a society in Malaysia then was six months. I got my registration in two months. Okay. The moral of the story there is that you need to trust that if you're doing something good, there are other people out there who will help you. So I refuse to believe that there's evil more than good. But it's about connecting the dots and you know, putting it out there and then you know, it will come back to you. So the rest is history. We started the organization. When we started, everyone who wanted to go on mission had to pay the airfare. Not only you go to war zone, you have to pay to go to the war zone. <laughs> but a leader is not a leader unless he has followers. He or she has followers, right? So I put it out there. Who wants to go to Kosovo with me? Believe it or not, people wanted to come. And I was looking at these people coming to sign up and I was like, are they... Are they as insane as I am? They don't even know me. Some I met in Bangsa, McDonald's, you know. I mean, just to recruit people, you know. And one professor from UM who said, I'm going to be in Edinburgh as an examiner. I will join you in Rome and then we'll cross into Kosovo. And this is, you know, a serious war, war, war zone, right? But that was how we started. Really full of passion, not a lot of money. But I took out all my Tabung Haji money from my savings. I thought God would understand. Um, so, so, you know, and, and I said, well, this is my contribution, and we, the rest is history, of course. We grew the organization from just a few people, no staff, to an organization by the time I left in 2009 that had about 50 staff in Malaysia, about 5,000 volunteers, and worked in about 20 countries. Now, going into the humanitarian field is not about being a goody goody. It's about being a, a really, you have to really think strategically. You get into areas where life is not usual and it's business unusual. The, the quotes from Nelson Mandela that really you know, touched my heart and was you know, 
guiding lights for me also was that you know a good leader doesn't stand in front when there's a victory, but it's about being in front when there's danger. So I would tell the team, guys, I know this is difficult, but I'm with you. I will be there. I will be in front of you. And I will help you, and if there's any risk, I take it first. So the other question that people ask my husband, how come you don't go with your wife? <laughs> to which he says, you know, ladies first. <laughs> so, um, so that's, that's the story. Well, he did. I'll tell you the story because it's important. He came with me on the one mission to Afghanistan. At the time, the Taliban was in rule, and I was very concerned about health for women. And he said, you know, I think I better go with you. You know, they ask you, why, why are you in this team with all these men? At least, you know, one relative, you know, I'll go with you. He was so scared, you know, poor guy. I think after that, he never, he said, you know, I think, you know, one person must stay in case anything happens, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so we went to Afghanistan. And you can imagine Afghanistan under Taliban rule, 2001. And going in, and they're saying, who's the leader? And then, you know, everybody looked at me and says, we don't say you're the leader. La. You know, it's difficult, you know, if we say you're the leader, they say, how come woman leading you? What kind of people are you? And then I said, okay. So my husband went with a couple of men to meet some of the commanders to say we need access into some of these areas. And they said, who's the leader? And he actually said, she's a woman. To which I think, you know, there were some facial expressions that were probably quite scary. But he said, but I know her really well. And if you, if you confront her, she might not be very nice to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to confront the commander. And, you know, the bearded gentleman with the M16 and everything. And I looked at the guy and smiled. And he said, Talk, you know, some of them are actually highly educated, right? So when we started talking and they, you know, were kind of being, you know, like, what the hell are you here? And they were very surprised because, who are you? Where are you from? Malaysia. Malaysia. Tun Mahade. Everybody knows Tun Mahade. <laughs> Even Taliban. So, you know, so, so, so you know, uh, uh, so it was like, uh, you know, then, the, you know, being Malaysian is so special. I mean, people don't realize this. I go to Africa, I go to, you know, anywhere in the world, they say, I say I'm Malaysian, kind of the barrier kind of falls. Something about being Malaysian, I think we're just a non-threat to the rest of the world, that's why. Um, so anyway, to cut the long story short, you know, dealing with them, confronting with them, I had to deal, play a bit of hardball, right? So I looked at him and I said, look, what's the worst that can happen? I told him, no worry. I went to see the commander, I said, you and I, read the same books. You and I share the same faith. We may have very different ways of expressing our faith. If you kill me, you know what? I might go to heaven, but you will not taste heaven. And I think they didn't expect me to say that. But what ensued was nine acres of land to actually work. They said, we won't disturb you. Do do your work. But be careful, don't touch our women, telling the men. Okay. Being a woman meant I could get access. I could go into people's homes and talk to their women. When you can talk to the women, no matter how tough you are, the wife will convince you what is right. So we would talk to the women and say, please tell your husband, uh, this fella, don't be so hard on us. We want to have health care for women and so forth. Because women in Afghanistan were dying by the flies. Afghanistan had the highest maternal mortality rate. Only one in five children would live to see their fifth birthday. So I was so you know, focused on trying to get health care into Afghanistan. So we established a health center and so forth, and we actually established one in Kandahar. As my American friends said to me, gosh, you're real crazy. Going to Afghanistan is one thing. Setting up in Kandahar, are you mad? What were you on, weed? What, you know? So, <laughs> so, so I mean, Kandahar is like the hot seat of you know, everything bad. But we established it, and even now as I have left, it's still there. It's still providing health care to women and children. And we've never been disturbed, never. Not once have we been threatened uh, by anyone. And it's all run by local staff now. So 
I think one of the things I learned is that, yes, you take calculated risks, but you build a network that protects you. So going to Afghanistan is one thing, but drinking tea with every tribal leader or one person connected to any tribe between Quetta to Kandahar is essential. When we were in Darfur, working in Darfur is pretty scary because the desert is large and vast and buildings are not close to each other. So the UN would tell us, you know, we have a security tree. So we have the security tree, where to go, I don't know. But you know, if you're an NGO, you don't stay in the same compound as the UN, especially if you're a non-Western NGO. So you stay a bit further out. And I looked at it and I said, oh, how are we going to get to the compound when the fighting starts? Because it does take time. So with the team, we said, what's our security tree? So we said, what are, who are the three most important people in this community? The imam, the teacher, the midwife. Let's talk to them. So we talked to the imam and so forth, gave him tea and everything. And we said, I have my team here. They're all not, not Muslim, huh? they're mixed. But we are a mixed organization. So I said, we have to protect my staff. Otherwise, how are we going to, to work here and get health care to your women? I said, OK, we'll come back in three days' time. They come back in three days' time with lamb, biryani, everything. You know, come to us and they say, OK, when this fighting happens here, you run here. This guy will take you here. This guy will take you here. This guy will take you here through the village. Blah, 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 blah. So our security tree, tree was actually much safer than probably a UN security tree because it had the community taking care of us. That's the difference. But in 2003, before the bombing in, Af uh, in Iraq, we did our mission and we assured the Iraqi government that the health facilities, that should they need us, we will be there. Some of you may know, now, April 12, 2013, I got shot. Iraq. I was in a convoy with two ambulances, a team, and we were in one hospital working, delivering supplies, and the pharmacist came to me and said, you need to go to the children's hospital. These people are being sewn by needle and thread there. You need to go. So we said, okay, we have our supplies. Well, no. Is it safe? Is this route safe? And he said, I go on this route three times a day. So we asked some of the people around. We had a security advisor. And we said, what do you think? Should be fine. Two convoys, two ambulances, let's go. Sometimes with all the calculations you do on risk, there's always the, the black swan, right? What happened was, hours before we were moving on the road, Saddam and his people opened up their weapons cache, and people were just taking guns and bullets. You could buy bullets for 50 cents a pack. And they started to do a little shooting across the streets. And we happened to be the ambulances trying to get from one hospital to another that for some reason people started to shoot. It was a mob psychology. Young people with guns just shooting across each other. Who later on, by the way, came back and gave us cake and all this kind of stuff after, after killing two of my staff. They killed my driver and the pharmacist who actually told me it was safe. Sometimes intuition is strange. As I was crossing the border, I had an intuition the night before that I would not come back. I called my husband and I said, you know, I've transferred all the shares to you, blah, blah, you know. <laughs> um, I, I have a bad feeling, but I'm still an obedient Muslim wife. And I said, if you tell me I can't go, I won't go. And he said, don't be silly. This is your destiny. Whatever you do, I'm going to get reward because I can't do the things that you do. So the one thing I said to him is, you know, if I die, I left a list of women who you might want to consider marrying. <laughs> um, because some of them are my friends, you know, they like the kids, you know, so, you know, marry well. Huh? If I, if I, I don't want my children to be badly treated by some horrible stepmother. So please make sure, you know, and he always says to me, I uh, no need to wait till you die, you know, you give me that. <laughs> Why don't you give me this list earlier, you know, so. So I, we, we always joke, because there's all sorts of rumours, you know, I'm unhappy, my husband had four wives and he wishes. But anyway, so to cut the long story short, so I went and had a very strange intuition. And my colleague, Dr. Baba, who was with me from Laka, I turned to him and I said, I don't have a good feeling, Baba. 
He says, I don't have a good feeling too. I said, do you want to stay in the hotel and not go? He says, no. I also called my wife. And I told her that I, I need to do this and all. So he said, fine. The driver came to me and he said, I'm so scared, doctora. I said, I know you're scared. If you're scared, we abandon. Because if you can't drive us, we're in trouble. You know the roads and everything. And he came back to me in the morning. He says, you know what? I'm OK. I, this is what I'm going to do. This is my service. His name was Gafur. And he said, I will drive you. I will drive the ambulance. He said, OK. <coughs> and um, it's a very sad story, but I will tell you that in 2003, I went for Hajj, uh, and I did my Hajj 2003 to a company uh, to do, uh, was with, for, for Yasmin, Yasmin Ahmad, who passed away. She wanted me to go for Hajj, so I took her. And uh, I bought a cheap Casio watch, you know, once you get in Mecca. And Gafur had the same watch as I did. So he said to me, remember the watch, we have the same watch. So, when we were driving, and everybody was being shot left and right, um, for some reason too, we decided to switch places on the van. So Baba moved to the outside, I went inside. I usually like the fan, the, the wind, so I always sit on the side, I right? switched. So he got the worst of it. The bullet went through him, uh, and then you know, went through a Reader's Digest uh, book, and into my left hip. Uh, I, I joke about it, but Seriously, you need a little bit of padding huh, to, to stop bullets. So, so, you know, it's okay to be a bit padded. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, but Baba was very badly hit. He was bleeding, he was unwell, he was unconscious. And, and, then, and you know, everything happened in just minutes. You know, the guy, the pharmacist, actually took a bullet straight into his chest and I tried to resuscitate him. He, was, he died. We got out, and it's funny what you remember, but what I remember most people trying to take my shoes. Because the children and all that started pointing to me, and I thought, oh my God, I peed in my pants, because it was warm in my pants. So I said, oh, this is embarrassing. Then I kind of put my finger there, and I said, oh, there's a hole in my left hip. Hang on a minute. And I looked, and it was blood. But people saw me and said, lie down, lie down. They wanted to take my shoes. And I'm like, no, no, don't take my shoes. They were like, kick us. So, you know, you, you can't take my shoes. Um, so, so anyway, so we went to the hospital. And Baba was there. We were trying to get him stabilized. And, uh, you know, I had to deal with the hole. The poor guy, the first guy I met, I just grabbed him and I said, hold my pants down. And he was like, you know, and, but uh, I think he was more shocked than me. But, uh, you know, he had to hold my pants down. You know, I put a stitch in and I said, now pull. So just keep the bleeding, you know, stop the bleeding, but let's deal with Baba. The only hospital we could take him in was deeper and deeper into the terrible territory. But it had operating theatre, blood bank and all that, so we went. So he, we took him into surgery, uh, you know, all this while I thought I was really, really calm. But the minute he was on the operating theatre and he was done, that's when I broke down and cried. Because the relief you feel that, you know, at least you managed to help your colleague uh, out of this trouble. And I felt so angry, so guilty. You know, what a fool I was. Did I endanger my entire team? I'm stupid. I'm reckless. What am I, what am I doing here? And you know, all these things come into your head. But and then you, you live through the security in your head. I did this. I did this. I did this. I talked to you know, Central Command. I talked to Americans. I talked to everybody to make sure they knew we were on this thing. We had a white flag. We had this. And everything was correct. But still, we were shot. And then the door knocked on my door. And many of the doctors had fled the hospital. And the junior doctor and the nurse comes in and she said, we have a problem. And I said, what? There's a woman who's just come in, very heavily pregnant. She's had three previous caesareans. She has a hemoglobin of six, which is very anemic. We have one pint of blood. We need a good surgeon. You're the only surgeon now in the hospital. So, you know, I hobbled over, told my colleagues, put a box there because I couldn't stand straight. So uh, I said, just hold my back. We'll do the surgery. Got the baby boy out. Everything went well. And I said to the nurse, I'll come back and see her. Six, seven hours, I'll come and walk. As I walked back to my room in the hospital, bullets were like flying over the, the wall. It was horrible, horrible feeling. And then I came back six, seven hours later, and she was sitting in bed, folding her clothes. And I like, this is not the patient I, no, no. 
hey, this is not the woman that I've just done surgery. In Malaysia, oh my God, they've been lying flat for three days, you know, as though the world, you know, patients like, you know, so you know, patients are so pampered here, right? So, and I, you know, so they said, no, she is, she's the one. So I looked at her and I said, why? What, what are you doing? And she said to me, if the bullets, or rather, if the bombs drop on my home tonight, I want to be with my children. And I said, you know, why am I complaining about this bullet in my hip? You know, it must be a reason why I'm here. You know, we can't fight our destiny sometimes. And, our, you know, we try to avoid it, but, you know, it, it happens, right? There must be a reason that, you know, I'm there. And it was easy then to come back and say, give up. I don't want to do this anymore. I put my friends' lives in danger. Then I thought about it. Uh, and a lot of psychotherapy, talking to people, you know, and, and so on and so forth. One of the things I did was go to the UN and say, we are no longer sacrosanct. The humanitarian arena is now a dangerous arena because of the invasion of many of the troops into many of the countries. People now cannot distinguish between people who want to help us and people who want to kill us. So it has unfortunately blurred lines. And even though, you know, it's just so tragic, but the humanitarian arena is no longer sacrosanct. One month later, Margaret Hassan, who is a good friend, no, one month, sorry, one month later, the Red Cross ICRC facility in Baghdad was bombed. Margaret Hassan, who had worked her entire life, she's Irish, she's from CARE, who children on the street called Mama Margaret, was killed. And then the UN Canal Hotel was bombed, killing some of the top brains in the humanitarian and development sector. And then I realized that if I gave up, I would not be doing any justice to the people who lost their lives in the service of others. What I needed to do is make the organization strong. The tsunami happened. You must know that Mercy Malaysia was raised on the contributions of my patients and Malaysians. They have no foreign funding. Corporations, public funding, a man from Ipoh who would drive down and go up the stairs. You know, Sharin will remember this, she's in the crowd, uh, you know, to give us $100. Children with Down syndrome in Johor who would wash cars and give us money. Children in boarding schools in Trangano who would fast for a week and give us all their meal monies uh, for, for lunch. So this was the, I think the, the generosity we got was beautiful money. So when the tsunami happened, we had very little money left in the bank. We were not a huge organization. But I remember that meeting saying, no one's gone to Aceh yet. This epicenter is there. All the news we're getting is Phuket, Sri Lanka. Something bad is happening there. We need to go. And they said, how do you get in there? It's a war zone. People don't realize this. Aceh was a war zone. So we said, let's try, let's go. Let's empty everything out. If we go out, we go out in style, man. You know, we, we, we do this, so after this, Mercy Malaysia closes us down, we've done our best. We're not here to prove anything. So we did. The rest is history. When CNN came, the only doctors there was our young doctor, Dr. Leong. And everybody then started, hey, these guys are pretty serious. One, they went to a war zone, blah, blah, blah. and of course, I started getting phone calls. Now, in Malaysia, there's some iconic leaders in the business world. One of them is Hassan Marikan. And people used to tell me, oh, Hassan Marikan doesn't like talking to people, doesn't like talking to NGOs. Ah, you, no, no, he won't. My phone rang in Aceh, and it was Hassan Marikan. I swear, I was sitting on the thing, I stood up and said, yes, Tansri. And he said, how much do you need? I said, what do you mean, how much do I need? How much money do you need? And I said, I don't want your money. He's like, what? I said, I don't want your money because I don't know. I need to do a proper assessment what's needed before I tell you a figure. I can't tell you I need 10 million when I maybe need two. I wouldn't be honest. I need to do a proper assessment, then I will tell you. OK, never mind. I give you one million first. It's OK. So I took it. And then other people, Kazana, other corporations, Pricewaterhouse, all these people came to me and said, what do you need? And I said, I need my organization to outlive me. I need help. I need good corporate governance. I need a solid organization, processes, SOPs, everything. After you do all that for me, I tell you how much I need. So 
they got the best brains, Boston Consulting Group, Pricewaterhouse, Hay Group, Accenture, you name it. Everybody came to help us pro bono, you know, had a proper charter and everything. We took our organization through being the first organization in Asia to be certified for humanitarian accountability. And the yeah. so, <clears throat> so it was this commitment, right? And then, you know, of course, after that, I turned around. Now I tell you how much I need. I need this amount of millions to run my organization professionally. If you give me this, then whatever I raise from the public will be for the people. So maybe it was a good day, but for some reason they agreed. But what was even more clever was I pegged the dollar at 3.8. <laughs> Because I quoted them in US dollars and I said I need this million for my operations at 3.8. And of course, a couple of months later, it was unpegged. So Tanji Azman always says, you know this one. She fooled me. She actually, you know, how can I, you know, as a corporation, this you know, NGO person got me to actually peg the dollar and pay. The rest is history, but they've become huge supporters. So the organization became much more professional then. And then we were much more in the international arena. We decided to play with the big boys. We went into international meetings. I was on several boards internationally. I was on the board of Save the Children. I was the vice chair of International Council, all this stuff. And so this little dream that I had <clears throat> to build a platform for Malaysians to do good, the little dream that humanitarianism is as much about good management and good governance and running a corporation the same way. But most importantly, bringing people from all walks of life who would actually put their lives on the line for something they believed in. We had a common ambition, a common goal. It's easy to look at us and think, you know what, they've done so much for these people who, who needed their help. It's wrong. We have learned so much in this journey. When I was in Aceh, I met a little girl her name was Ulfa. If, uh, I have, you know, I'm going to get Muslim Malaysia to give each of you a copy of our book that I wrote during my time. I'll remember that, Raji. It's a beautiful coffee table book. I think they have more. She was actually being breastfed and she was swept uh, by the waves and her mother died. Every, you know, so only she and her sister survived and her, her husband, uh, her father. But the children were young, but yet, Every time we came to the camp, you're talking about seven-year-olds, they would actually rush into their tent and pour a glass of water and run to you to give you a drink, to sit down, share whatever but half banana they had. You know, when I went to places like Pakistan, I was there for Eid, feeling very sorry for myself, alone on the mountaintop, with the border of Kashmir, uh, India and Pakistan. And you know, children would come up and feed you sweet rice. Uh, you would see people in Kosovo who didn't have much food baking bread so that every household would, build, would bake an extra loaf for each of us. And you know, it was this beauty of people realizing that you know, they wanted to be part and parcel of, of our work and how much we've learned from them about dignity, about courage, about resilience. I say to people, and we talk about innovation, everybody's talking about innovation, innovation, big word now. But the innovation you see at village level when everything is lost, the innovation you see when people have to get on with life with very little, is something that we need to learn from. Because then you can scale it up. Because it's the concepts of how you take very little and make it much more. And I tell the story about this little coffee shop in Aceh that emerged and we like, who gave them this name it was Mercy Coffee Shop. So I walked in and I said, um, when did you set this up? And they said, well, when you guys came and you gave us rice and all this kind of stuff, some of your volunteers gave money you know, and this kind of stuff. So we decided that you know, we have to have something sustainable. So we opened this little tent, coffee shop, but they had a karaoke machine and a television. So they said, we come here, we talk to each other, we debrief, you know, we are all affected by the tsunami, we sing, and then I said, okay. We'll also use the microphone to give information about disaster preparedness, about you know, educating them uh, about hygiene and things like that. So let's use the innovation they've created to, to in further innovate. So 
I can't think about these things. It has to be people affected by crises who themselves are leaders. We always forget that. We always forget that the people we help are also leaders and we can learn from them. And I think the whole concept of humanitarianism is about respecting affected people. So I left in 2009 because it was never about me. It was about creating an organization for Malaysians to come together and make a difference in the world. It was so easy to leave. I have no role with the organization now, but I know that we've planted a very strong seed. So right now, I have a bigger challenge. I'm in the United Nations in New York, heading what is the World Humanitarian Summit, which is the first ever World Humanitarian Summit. Why? Because 10 years ago, we were dealing with 30 million people who needed help. Now, we deal with 100 million. In 2003 and 2014, the needs in terms of financial needs to serve the needs of people is up by 430%. The way the UN, the international system, does business is no longer sustainable. What we need to do is bring in new ideas, private sector, diaspora, affected people, putting more, more responsibility and ownership on governments. So basically, I've been hired to be a disruptor. It's a difficult job because everyone is your enemy. For many UN agencies, it's like, oh my god, she's going to change things for a lot of the international organizations, will the money flow other places? For governments, it's suspicion. What are they trying to do here? But we managed to corral a really, really great team now and communicate it very strongly that this is about change. The world has changed, and so must humanitarian action. This, I'm going to dish it out, is going to revolutionize the world. Because right now, it's no longer about sending rice and beans and stuff. It's about sending a barcode to affected people so then they can stimulate markets and buy things. Now you can get education through internet. I always talk about Somalia, one of the most dangerous places in the world. What are the three things you can get anywhere in Somalia? Cut, which they chew, and they're high most of the time. Coca-Cola, anywhere, and mobile phones. There are 11 telcos in Somalia. I don't think there are 11 in New York. And certainly the coverage is better. <laughs> if you live in New York, you understand what I mean. It's always drop calls, yeah? Anyway, so the world has changed. So we now need to engage people like you in the room, people who will make a difference because you have the knowledge. And we need to more than ever live in a networked age where every one of us, no matter what the profession, must believe in the sense of possibility must believe that we must leave the world a better place. Must believe that no matter how evil it is right now, there are good people too. And I think at every individual level, if we can do one single thing each day, which I love your pay it forward, by the way, we have to do it. And you know, Nelson Mandela said, if you speak in a language they understand, they will listen with their head. If you speak in a language they use, they listen with their heart. And that is not just the metaphorical language, it's about other things, communication and stuff. So I think we all need to learn to speak better to each other. So that's my little journey. Um, I think uh, I certainly am not the most courageous person in the world. I am nervous and I'm scared sometimes. But overcoming fear is important. But always seeing that you are just one little part of the bigger equation. And to surround yourself with people, friends, mentors, coaches, who will tell you things you don't want to hear is the important thing. So I've been very blessed that I've been surrounded by people who've always wanted to tell me how to do it well, even though it hurt me, even though you know, there are challenges and there are failures along the way. But what choice do we have? We have to believe the sense of possibility because we owe it to our kids. We owe it to the future generations who will judge us for our sense of not wanting to see the sense of possibility. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.